Welcome to a conceptual introduction to random variables and probability distributions. This is a video lesson for probability and statistics. Now that we have a theoretical framework in place for describing what probability is, we'll now move on to developing techniques for systematically computing the probabilities of events in our probability spaces. To do this, we're going to need to devise practical ways of describing the events in our sample spaces and of constructing probability measures that compute their probabilities. Random variables and probability distributions will be our primary tools for accomplishing this task. We've already established the concept of a probability space, omega S and P. One of the key difficulties in constructing a probability space lies in correctly defining a probability measure. One way to go about this systematically requires the introduction of two new concepts, a random variable and a probability distribution. We'll define both, but we'll begin with the definition for a random variable. Let omega be a sample space that we hope to construct a probability space around. We say x is a random variable for omega if for each outcome in omega there is a corresponding unique numerical value of x. If omega is finite or countably infinite, we say that x is a discrete random variable. If, on the other hand, omega is uncountably infinite, we say x is a continuous random variable. So let's take a moment to illustrate this concept of a random variable through an example. So the following are examples of discrete random variables used to model a sample space. We could imagine rolling a six-sided die the sample space for this scenario consists of the six faces of the die that can appear after a roll. We'll encode these numerically as the integers 1 through 6. So our random variable x takes values from the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. It's a discrete random variable for this sample space. Alternatively, we could imagine selecting n trout from a population consisting only of rainbow and brown trout. If we were to ask what's the number of rainbow trout that are included in our sample, then this quantity may have n plus 1 outcomes because our sample may include anywhere from 0 through n rainbow trout. Therefore, x belongs to the set uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n. This serves as a random variable for describing our sample space. The previous random variables were discrete and finite. It's certainly possible to have a random variable that is discrete and countably infinite as well, and that's the subject of our next example. A researcher for an insurance firm is tasked with counting the number of traffic accidents that occur each day at a certain busy intersection. Her counts can, at least in principle, take on any value starting from zero on up through the possible integers. There's no intrinsic upper limit. Therefore, if she lets the variable x represent a daily count of accidents, it may take values from the set x in 0, 1, 2, 3, and on up indefinitely. This serves as a countably infinite discrete random variable for the sample space in this scenario. The difference between countably infinite and uncountably infinite can be a little bit difficult to grasp at first, but an example might help shed some light on the idea an astrophysicist has been cataloging data about asteroids that pass near the Earth. One of the quantities she has been recording is the relative speed at which any given asteroid passes the Earth. She uses an instrument that measures the speed in meters per second with arbitrary precision. This means that each measurement may be a real number that can be as small as zero, but can never quite reach the speed of light in a vacuum, roughly 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Within this range, there are uncountably many real values she could possibly measure. Therefore, any random variable that models her measurements must be a continuous random variable. Where random variables are the tools that we use to describe the individual outcomes and then the aggregate events within our probability space, probability distributions are the tools we use to measure probabilities of the events. Probability mass functions, or discrete probability distributions, assign probabilities to each value of a discrete random variable. To understand how this works, we should probably begin with a formal definition. So we're going to let omega be a finite or countably infinite sample space we hope to construct a probability space around. 
if x is a random variable of omega, then we say that f of x is a probability mass function if the following two conditions are true. First, f can never be smaller than 0, and it can never exceed 1, regardless of which value of the random variable x we apply it to. And second, if we apply f to all possible values of the random variable, and then sum them up, then that sum must always total to 1. Well, this definition tells us what a probability mass function is, but we might also want to know how we create one, or why would we? In particular, we probably need to spend some time unraveling the reasons behind the different components of our definition. What do they really mean? We'll build some intuition about probability mass functions experimentally by imagining a random variable that can take on any of the integer values 0 through 25. We'll collect samples of observations of that random variable of increasing size and then create frequency and then later relative frequency histograms for each sample. The animation you're watching now depicts what that process might look like if you were actually to conduct it. We began with a histogram representing a relatively small sample of just 10 observations, and it was a very flat, hard to see histogram. But as the number of observations in the samples increase into the hundreds and then later into the thousands, some structure begins to emerge. A peak begins to grow with some dispersion around some point of central tendency that seems to appear somewhere around a value of 9, 10, or 11 for the random variable x. That peak, or the mode of the histogram, seems to persist in that, that general area as the number of observations increases. However, this is just a frequency histogram. The height of each bar simply represents the absolute count of observations of each value of the random variable that appears within a particular sample. So it can still tell us intuitively that the values clustering around the mode seem to be more likely to appear in a given sample than the values out in the tails of the histogram, out towards the extreme values of 0 or 25. But it's not giving us any information about probability yet. Well, this begs the question, could we have a histogram whose bar heights represent the probabilities of each outcome in the sample space? Well, such a thing is possible. All you need to do is cause the heights of each bar in the histogram to represent relative frequency rather than frequency. And we do this by dividing the heights of the frequency bars by the total number of observations in a particular sample. And that is what the animation we're watching now depicts. We're collecting the same data, and we're putting that data or summarizing that data into a histogram, but the histogram has been rescaled so that every time we render it, its bar heights represent a relative frequency. And so as the number of observations in a particular sample increases, that histogram becomes a more and more reliable empirical estimator of the probability of observing any particular value of the random variable x ranging over its possible values of 0 through 25. So what we're looking at in some sense as the number of observations settle down is a experimentally derived or empirical probability mass function. Each bar height is a value between 0 and 1. We could verify that the sum of the bar heights equals 1, and they're a measure of likelihood of each possible observation of the random variable in comparison to the others. So we've seen a brief demonstration of how you might experimentally construct or empirically define a probability mass function for a random variable that represents a set of outcomes in a sample space that 
ultimately we would hope would form the basis of a probability space that we would construct and try to study. There's other ways to construct probability mass functions, and in our next video we'll actually look at some very practical probability mass functions that are theoretical rather than empirical. But whether they're theoretical or empirical, it turns out that a probability mass function generates the necessary building blocks for constructing a probability measure on a probability space. A probability mass function assigns a probability value to each outcome in the sample space, each possible value of the random variable, in a way that ensures that the sum of the probabilities of all outcomes in the sample space is 1. This is the basis of the following theorem. Let omega be a finite or countably infinite sample space of outcomes that has the associated discrete random variable x. Let f of x be a probability mass function on omega, and let s equal p of omega represent the sigma algebra generated by forming the power set of omega. Then, for any event e in s, the probability of e is going to be computed by summing f of x over all outcomes x and e. This is going to be a probability measure on s. As a result, omega, s, and p is going to form a probability space. Well, as I've already said, one of the hardest parts of forming a probability space is constructing a reasonable probability measure. And this theorem constructively tells us how to do that as long as we can form a probability mass function on the discrete random variable that describes the sample space of our candidate probability space. So it's an important enough theorem that we're going to prove it. And to prove it, we must show that P, as we've defined it, satisfies the three properties of a probability measure. So we'll begin with the first one. If E is any event in S, then P of E is real and non-negative. We can see this is true by construction. We've already defined P of E to be the sum of F of X over all outcomes X and E. Since f of x is between 0 and 1 for each x in the sample space, it's certainly true that it's between 0 and 1 for each x in our event, because our event is a subset of the sample space. Therefore, we're just taking a bunch of values that lie between 0 and 1 and summing them up. That sum of real values between 0 and 1 must therefore result in a real value that is greater than or equal to zero. Couldn't possibly be a negative number. Well, moving on in our efforts to show that P forms a probability measure on omega and S, we've got to be able to demonstrate that when we apply P to the sample space itself, we get a value of one. Well, this has also got to be true by the definition of the probability mass function, because P of the sample space is just the sum of f of x over all possible random variable values in the sample space. And by definition of any probability mass function, that must be 1. So that's automatically satisfied for us. Well, finally, we'll need to demonstrate that the third property of a probability measure is true. Specifically, if we have E1, E2, E3, and so on, serving as a countable collection of events in our sigma algebra that are all mutually exclusive, meaning that they share no common intersection. Then the following formula has got to be true. If we form the union of each of those events, E1, E2, E3, and then take the probability of that union using our candidate probability measure function P, we should be able to demonstrate that we'd obtain the same value if we had just applied P to each of the events, E1, E2, E3, and so on individually, and then computed the sum of those resulting values. So we need an argument for why this third property of the probability mass function is true for our candidate function P. To see why it's true, we must simply understand that the mutual exclusivity of the events E1, E2, E3, and so on guarantees that no outcome in a particular E sub i 
may also belong to any other E sub J as long as J is not equal to I. So therefore, if we analyze P applied to our union over all of the events, E1, E2, E3, and so on, that's the same as the sum of our function F applied to each outcome in this union. And I can rewrite that as a double sum. I can rewrite it as the sum over all of the events E1 through EN of F applied to each outcome in all of those, each of those events. And the mutual exclusivity ensures that there's no double counting, no repeated outcomes in one event or the others. So this simply results in the sum of P applied to each of the events E1, E2, E3, and so on. Well, as I've already said, in our next video lesson, we will introduce several practical probability mass functions that are used to model a whole array of different counting scenarios and the probabilities involved in them. We're going to illustrate a probability mass function, a theoretical probability mass function, for a countably infinite discrete sample space in the next example. So, if omega equals the set of integer values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, upward without limit, then define f of x to be the function 6 over the quantity x times pi squared. So this is a computation we can do for each value of x in our sample space omega. Now we can just do some inspection to see that f of x falls between the values of 0 and 1 no matter what value of x from omega we plug into it. One way of convincing ourselves of that is that the smallest value that we plug into f is 1, x equals 1. And that's going to result in a value of f equals 6 over pi squared. Pi is a little bit bigger than 3, so pi squared is a little bit bigger than 9. So f of x for x equals 1 is going to result in six, something a little smaller than 6 over 9. That's certainly a value that's greater than 0, less than or equal to 1. As we plug in greater values of x, then all that serves to do to f of x is produce smaller positive values. So every value of f falls between 0 and 1. Now there's something less clear that we're not going to bother to prove. It's provable, but we're, we're just not going to do it. But it's, it's also true that if you were to sum f over all possible values, x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, onward up toward infinity, then that sum is going to come out to be exactly 1, therefore satisfying the second condition needed for a probability mass function. It takes a little bit of doing to prove that. It takes a little bit of calculus, but it is true. So this infinite sum does converge to 1, and f turns out to be a probability mass function. We could visualize it if we would like to, and that's what we're going to do in our next slide. So what you're looking at now is essentially a theoretical relative frequency histogram that represents that theoretical probability mass function we just saw. The bar heights represent the probabilities assigned to each possible value of x, our, our random variable. And we can see that the most likely values of x are down towards 1 and 2, and their probabilities rapidly taper towards 0 the larger x gets. And that trend would continue if you allowed the graph to span beyond x equals 15 to the right, as we're just seeing in this graph. Well, it turns out that discrete probability distributions or probability mass functions aren't the only kinds of probability distributions that you would apply to a sample space and a sigma algebra in hopes of creating a, a probability space. We've already seen how useful probability mass functions can be when working with discrete random variables. 
but we've got to remember that there are also continuous random variables that we might be interested in. And so we could ask, is it possible to devise something similar for a continuous random variable? And it's going to turn out that when x is a continuous random variable, a probability mass function just simply cannot be used to measure the probability of each outcome in the sample space. We're going to explore why that is in some upcoming animations. But in order to overcome the problem in general, we're going to need to introduce the concept of probability density in place of probability mass. For us to do this, we'll need to borrow a tool from calculus, yet we really won't need to know how to use it directly in order to analyze continuous random variables in the way that we have planned. That all is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, though. And as I said, what we're going to do soon is view some animations that are going to allow us to explore the reasons behind the statement that if x is a continuous random variable, a probability mass function can't be used to measure the probability of each outcome in the sample space or to assign a probability to each outcome in the sample space. And so really to see why that is, we're going to do what any reasonable person should be, be doing when they're told that something they'd like to do isn't going to work. They, they should try it anyway and figure out why it won't work. So let's imagine that we just go back to our frequentist experimental approach to building a probability mass function that we saw earlier and apply that to a continuous random variable. In particular, we'll imagine that we've got a random variable that we can measure with arbitrary numerical precision. And we'll start collecting samples of measurements of that random variable. And then we'll attempt to build a histogram that summarizes the number of times we observe each value of the random variable within a sample. And then we'll let the size of that sample grow and see if structure in that histogram emerges, just like it did when we created our, our absolute frequency and relative frequency histograms that ultimately led to an empirical probability mass function for our imaginary discrete random, exam, random variable in an earlier example. We'll also turn around afterwards and try to create a relative frequency histogram in the same way. So let's see what happens. So we begin with a sample of size 10, and then the sample size increases. The histogram that results from each sample does have some structure. We can see that the observations are clustered around a value of 7. There's, there's a higher density of observations around that value of 7 than the lower values of towards 0 or higher values up towards 15 or more. However, the absolute frequency of observations never exceeds one. We've got to ask ourselves, why is that? If we think about this enough, there really is a reasonable explanation. We are making arbitrary precision measurements of a continuous random variable. That means there is a continuum of possible values in this random variable, starting in this case from zero on upward indefinitely. We're not just looking at integer values, we are looking at all possible real values over that range as candidates for measurements that we can make. And so a value of 7.01 and 7.01000000001 will be treated as two distinct observations. They're not the same value. Therefore, on the histogram, those values would be represented by two very close together but still different spikes. Therefore, the, the chances with this random variable of ever making two observations of exactly the same value, not, 
not just two values that are very close, but exactly the same value is increasingly slim. It's almost zero. The implication of that is that any observation we could reasonably expect to make of a value of the random variable will happen with a frequency of at most one in a any given sample. We we'd almost never expect to see an observation happen two or three or, or, or let alone ten times. So our histogram is always going to have this flat structure with frequencies, absolute frequencies peaking at maximum values of one. And that's really a pretty big problem because if you remember that the histogram that we displayed in the previous animation, there did seem to be some clustering of values. It's just that that clustering was horizontal. We saw more spikes clustered around a value of about 7 than we did in the extremes of 0 or out towards 15 or even higher. But the frequency of observations isn't resolving that clustering. So we need a way to represent the fact that observations of our random variable seem to be more likely to cluster around a value of 7 or so than lower values of 0 or up towards 15. And this strict empirical approach of counting the number of times we observe each value of the random variable in a particular sample just isn't able to do that. Well, before we tackle that problem, we'll introduce another one. And that problem has to do with relative frequency. If we were to continue this frequentist approach and construct a relative he frequency histogram for our data sets of increasing size, what's going to happen is what you're seeing before your eyes now. The bar heights on our histogram representing approximations to the probability of making any particular observation, they're all going to drop towards zero. And that's because the absolute frequency bar heights in the previous histogram were always no more than one. And to convert those to relative frequency, we're simply dividing by the total number of observations. So as that grows, the relative frequencies shrink down towards zero. So we conclude that the probability, if we were to follow this approach, the probability of observing any single value of our random variable is going to be zero. Nothing is probable to happen. No observation, no one observation is probable to be made. So what do we do about that? That's certainly a, a, a non-useful, a kind of untenable situation. To resolve our problem, we have to change the question we're asking. Rather than ask, what is the probability x takes on a particular value, we'd ask, what is the probability x falls within a range of values? Specifically, we'll divide the range of reasonable values for x into subintervals of the same width. The width is 1 in the case of the animation we're looking at now. Then, we count the observations from our sample that fall within one of those intervals. That count becomes the frequency for that interval. Relative frequency is still computed by dividing frequency by the total number of observations in a particular sample. As we can see, this process results in a relative frequency histogram that has some of the central tendency and variability structure that we saw in the discrete case earlier. Well, there's nothing particularly sacred about setting the widths of our subintervals or our, our bins to be one all of the time. In the animation we're looking at, we've set those widths to be one half. In other words, all of the vertical rectangles are positioned over intervals that are exactly one half of a unit wide. Well, what's that bias? That, that essentially means that we're asking the question, What's the probability that we get an observation that falls in a narrower, more precise, more certain interval? That might be useful. In fact, we might even consider looking at this process with narrower subintervals. So in this animation, we're looking at the same data, but it's 
summarized with a histogram that's been constructed using subintervals that are even narrower. They're now a quarter of a unit wide. So we are essentially asking a more precise question. What's the probability that a particular observation of x falls within an even narrower interval? So we're, when we ask questions like that, we are more precisely pinning down the location of x. So the question we need to start thinking is, what is actually measuring probability in a histogram like this? Well, before answering that question, we'll push this idea of refining the widths of our subintervals or refining the widths of our bins even more. And so the bin widths, the interval widths in the current animation are one eighth of a unit wide. So we're asking an even more precise question of, you know, what's the probability that X falls within an interval that's exactly one eighth of a unit wide? To get to where we could answer that question, we really need to start thinking about well, what's common to these four or five different examples of, of relative frequency histograms. What common structure emerges? And we'll see that in the following still. There were some common features I hope you were able to detect in the preceding sequence of relative frequency histogram examples that we've just finished viewing. Regardless of whether the interval width was one or a half or a quarter, or even one eighth, those histograms, as the number of observations increased, seemed to be growing towards approximating some bell-shaped curve. And I've superimposed a reasonable candidate for that bell-shaped curve on uh, those the, the endpoints of each of those sequences of histograms where there, there were 5,000 uh, observations that were made in each of the samples. And we can see that they're all fitting pretty well. And so we need to return to this question of what is it about this approach that is representing a probability? And I, I hinted earlier that it's not the height of the bars in these histograms anymore. It's got to be something else. And I'm going to make the suggestion that what we, sh we should be thinking about is the area of the bars is a surrogate for probability rather than just the height. And here's why. When we ask the question, what's the probability that something, some observation is going to fall within a certain subinterval? we could have two things that are causing that probability to increase. One would be that there's a lot of observations tightly clustered around where that subinterval is found. But another thing that could increase the number of observations that are going to appear within that subinterval within that bar is that if the bar is just wide. So one of those traits has to do with the height of the bar, and the other trait has to do with the width of the bar. So if we just multiply those two together, height times width, we get the area of the bar that an observation falls in. So the greater the area of a particular bar on one of these histograms, the more observations we'd expect there to be in it. So in one of these relative frequency histograms, the area of a bar situated over a particular interval is going to have more to do with the probability that you would make an observation that would fall within that, that interval than the height. The area is going to represent the probability. The height is going to represent something called probability density. With that in mind, these red smooth curves that we're seeing on our diagram those are going to represent what's called a probability density function. And it's the theoretical probability distribution that we use to measure the likelihood of making different types of observations of our random variable. 
So let's turn this problem around backwards. Let's imagine we somehow had one of these probability density functions. How could we compute probabilities with it? Well, one approach would be to imagine pushing this process we've been observing to an extreme and to continue asking the question, what's the probability of observing a value of our random variable that falls within really a sequence of more and more refined and more and more narrow subintervals. Well, that's going to mean that the rectangles in our histograms become skinnier and skinnier. And eventually, those rectangles should provide a fairly good approximation to the area under the red probability density function curve. So if you wanted to find the probability that an observation x fell within some arbitrary interval, what you would need to do, or what you could do anyway, would be to find the rectangles that lie over top of that interval and add up all of their areas. And that's going to be your approximation to not only the probability of finding that observation within that arbitrary interval, but also it approximates the area between the probability density function curve and that interval along the x-axis. And that's certainly a viable means for computing the probability that an observation of x will fall within some arbitrary interval within our sample space, but it's a pretty tedious approach. And so we, we're really faced with the question now is, is there a better, more efficient way? And in many cases, there's at least one, and sometimes two, and we'll explore those next. Well, this is where calculus comes in, because what we're really talking about here is that in order to compute the probability that an observation of a random variable will fall within some arbitrary interval, we have to be able to calculate the area trapped between the probability density function curve and that interval on the x-axis. And the way to calculate areas of irregularly shaped regions like that is with the definite integral. And so we'll define that now, even though we're really not going to have to use it that much directly. So we'll let f of x be a function of a real value that is discontinuous at no more than a countable number of points in the interval x is greater than or equal to a and less than or equal to b. And this symbol, this sweeping curve-shaped symbol, represents the definite integral of f over that interval, x is greater than or equal to a and less than or equal to b. It measures the area between the graph of f of x, y equals f of x, and then the x-axis over the interval, x is greater than or equal to a and less than or equal to b. A definite integral is just a tool for computing the area between the graph of a function and the dependent axis. Definite integrals give us a very convenient way of computing probabilities of events that are tied to continuous random variables. But, and this is the important but, computer software will typically be doing the work of computing these integrals, and hence computing the area that we need, and hence the probability that we need for us in practice. We're not really going to be in the business of computing integrals by hand, like you might do in a calculus class. One of our main uses for the definite integral is that it's a, it's a theoretical tool. It's going to be a convenient notation that we will use to represent when we are computing the probability that a continuous random variable will fall within some interval taken out of its sample space. We need one more useful piece of information related to definite integrals before we can proceed. If our event E is a set that can be described as a countable union of intervals, x is greater than or equal to a1 and less than or equal to b2, and then x is also greater than or equal to a2 and less than b2, and so on, then the integral of f over that event is just equal to the sum of the individual integrals of f over the intervals that make up the event. So this means that an area between the graph of y equals f of x and the x-axis may be broken up into several pieces horizontally, 
and still computed using a definite integral. So this can be really useful for computing probabilities of events that can be thought of as various unions and intersections and relative complements of intervals. In other words, this just gives us a way of breaking the probability of a very complex event down into several probabilities of much simpler events with the aid of a probability density function. So with that in mind, we're finally at a state where we need to define what a probability density function is. If we let omega be a sample space with an associated continuous random variable x that describes its outcomes, omega must be a subset of the real line that can be represented by countable unions of intervals. If f is a function that is discontinuous at no more than a countable number of points in omega and f satisfies two conditions, f is greater than or equal to zero for all x in the sample space, and the total area between f and the x-axis over the entire region spanned by the sample space must be equal to 1. Then we can say that f is a probability density function. So once again, this, this definition tells us what a probability density function is. And even though we've hinted at this already, we need to know how to create one and why would we? Well, we have addressed that question at least in part when we built our example of a sequence of relative frequency histograms with bin widths that shrank down to arbitrarily small widths. And that led to the notion that we could use area under a curve as a surrogate for probability. But now we're going to take the theoretical approach to that and say, well, what happens if we just start with some function of f of x that satisfies the conditions necessary for it to be called a probability density function? How would we use it? And so I'm going to look at an example where I've just made up a function of x that is shaped in a way that it's relatively simple to compute area between the graph of that function and the x-axis without needing to know anything about integration or calculus. We just need to know a little bit about geometry. So if we consider this function that is defined as f of x equals 4x for all values of x between 0 and 1 half, and f of x equals 4 minus 4x for all values between 1 half and 1, well, we can check that f is a probability density function simply by graphing it over the interval of omega equals x greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 1. And that, we're going to take that to be our sample space. When we graph f of x, we can see that its graph is positive for all x in our sample space in omega. The graph lies above the x-axis, so it, it represents positive values. So that satisfies the first condition necessary for f to be a probability density function. We can also note that the area described by the integral of f over the sample space, look, it's just a triangle, and its base has length 1, and its height is 2. We can see that by inspection. So we don't need calculus at all to compute the area of that triangle. We can just use the formula for the area of the triangle, which is 1 half times the uh, width of the base times the height of the triangle. So 1 half times 1 times 2 is just 1. The area under that triangular region is 1. Therefore, we've satisfied the second condition required for f to be a probability density function. Now, I'm not going to include this explicitly in this example, but we could imagine how we could even use this probability density function to calculate the probability of some subinterval of our sample space. You can imagine maybe the interval from, uh, I don't know, one-eighth to one-quarter. X is between one-eighth and one-quarter. The area trapped between the probability density function f of x and that subinterval has a recognizable shape as well. If you tried to sketch it out, I hope you would see that we're talking about the area of a trapezoid. And if you think back to elementary geometry, there is a formula for computing the area of a trapezoid. 
So we could even use, again, without calculus, that particular example of a probability density function to compute probabilities of simple events that can be represented as subintervals of our sample space. That's something that's worth trying out on your own time, perhaps. However, I would also say don't get too hung up on computing probabilities within this particular example. You can do it, it's probably a good exercise to spend a little bit of time on, but ultimately we are going to, in the next video, develop some probability mass functions, and then the video following that, some probability density functions that have real applications to making measurements and computing probabilities of actually observing those measurements. Those are going to be the probability distributions that you want to put the bulk of your attention and energy into. Well, finally, we're going to need a way to use a probability density function to induce a measure on a probability space. There's many ways to do this, but the following theorem describes our approach. So this is this the purpose of this theorem is to generalize the idea that I briefly introduced in the last example of computing the probability of a subinterval of the, the simple sample space, x falling between 0 and 1. So any subinterval of x between 0 and 1 can be thought of an event of that sample space. And we devised a way to compute the probability of that event. We're just generalizing that idea now to more complex probability density functions and more complex sample spaces. So, if omega is an open subinterval of the real line, and f of x is a probability density function on omega, and if e is any event that may be represented through countable unions, intersections, or relative complements of open subintervals of omega, which describes our sigma algebra s, then the probability of e is just the integral of f over e. In other words, it's the area trapped between the graph of f and the region described by e on the x-axis. If we do that, P of E becomes a probability measure on our sample space in sigma algebra. In other words, omega S and P forms a probability space. Now, a proof of this theorem is definitely beyond the scope of this video lesson. It requires a fair amount of calculus, and we're just not going to go into it. However, what I will say is that that proof is at least analogous to the proof that we would apply for the corresponding theorem that a probability mass function can induce a probability measure on a discrete sample space. So there's some real similarities there and the two theorems serve the same purpose. So the upshot of those theorems is that whether our probability distribution is a probability mass function or a probability density function, it can serve as a very convenient tool for creating a probability measure on some already well understood sample space and sigma algebra. We are going to wrap up this video lesson with an introduction to a concept known as mathematical expectation. And mathematical expectation is something that is a consequence of having probability distributions in place. And so we'll begin by defining it, and then we'll spend a little bit of time trying to develop some intuition about what mathematical expectation is and represents and can do for us. So if we let omega be a sample space with a random variable x, and let f of x be a probability distribution on omega, and then we're finally, if we're going to let g of x be any function defined on omega, then we can say that the quantity, which we're going to define in two ways, e sub f of g, either equal to the sum of f times g over all possible values of x in the sample space, if x is a discrete random variable, or the integral of f times g with respect to x over all of x in the sample space omega, if x is a continuous random variable. So if we define e sub f of g using either of those two formulas, then it represents the expectation of the function g relative to f. So we need to spend some time trying to interpret what e sub f of g means, what the mathematical expectation of g relative to f means. Imagine for a minute that g of x might represent a measurement that can be performed and its value depends on the random variable x. 
So consider an example. X might represent the length of the side of some cube that can be measured with arbitrary numerical precision. G of X equals X cubed would represent the volume of that same cube. And we could measure that also with arbitrary numerical precision, but there's a, a link between the volume and the side of the cube's length. And that link is described by the function g of x. Then imagine that we perform this measurement over and over again, many times. We should expect that there's going to be some variation in our measurements due to error, uh, systematic error, measurement error, you know, whatever. There's going to be some variation in those measurements. We can't expect them to be perfectly precise. But we could ask the question, what do we expect that measurement to be, roughly? Is there some value that that measurement should be clustering around? Well, E sub F of G is the average value that we expect to observe for these measurements. So it is the value that we expect our measurement G to cluster around, provided that we know that F is distributed according to some probability mass or density function F. Mathematical expectation has a number of uses, and we'll see several of them as we proceed with our, our, our text and our video lessons. But one of the most important has to do with understanding probability mass functions themselves. The concept of expectation may be used to define the theoretical mean, variance, skew, and kurtosis of a distribution. We've already seen how these terms can represent the shape of a data set. But if we have a distribution that we believe describes the way that data should vary, then we would expect that that distribution is going to have a mean, variance, skewness, and kurtosis that's somehow similar or comparable to that of the data set that the distribution represents. So we need to define those different theoretical shape parameters in terms of mathematical expectation. So if we have f of x representing a probability distribution with a random variable x, so f could be discrete or continuous, then the mean of f is defined to be the expectation of x relative to the distribution of f. The variance is defined to be the expectation of the square of the deviation of x away from its mean. And the corresponding standard deviation is just defined to be the square root of the variance, the theoretical variance. We can also define a theoretical skewness and kurtosis for a probability distribution f. We define them a little bit differently from the mean and the, the uh, variance. They are both what are known as standardized moments of the distribution. And they're standardized because we compute a mathematical expectation relative to the standard deviation. And here's what I mean by that. The skewness of f is defined to be the mathematical expectation of the cube of the deviation of the random variable x from its mean divided by the cube of the standard deviation. So it's the ratio of, of that, that mathematical expectation and the corresponding power of the standard deviation. And then likewise, kurtosis is the fourth standardized moment, and it's defined to be the fourth power, the expectation, the mathematical expectation of the fourth power of the deviation of x from its mean relative to the distribution f divided by the fourth power of x's standard deviation. So these four parameters of any probability distribution should be comparable to the similarly named parameters of a data set that we believe to be described by that distribution. This concept is really important because we're going to see that this observation, that the theoretical shape parameters ought to be comparable to the empirical shape parameters of a data set modeled by a distribution is the basis for a method that we'll build for estimating unknown parameters of a probability distribution in the third chapter of our text. So we'll learn about that in future video lessons. With that, we've reached the end of this video lesson.
Thank you for watching. I hope you found it helpful, and I hope you'll be able to join us in future video lessons.